One of the major highlights of this year's Melbourne Documentary Film Festival is a film called The Sound of Identity. And it's my great pleasure to be speaking to the director of The Sound of Identity, James Kicklighter. James, welcome to Movie Metropolis. Thank you for having me, Peter. I appreciate it. This is such an incredible story about the first transgender opera singer in an American uh, sort of venue set in Tulsa, Oklahoma. How did it come about that you uh, learned about Lucia Lucas and her uh, opera singing and so on? Of course. Well, I was approached by the producers about three months before the performance. They said they had gotten the rights to do a film about uh, the first transgender opera singer and would it be something that I would be interested in doing. Uh, I told them no three times, actually, uh, because I wasn't sure, one, if I knew enough about opera to tell that story, Two, I wasn't sure if I was qualified to tell a story about a trans person. And three, I didn't want to make a trans film about transitions or boycotts or protests that just didn't interest me in any way. And so on the third time when I said no, uh, the producer said, well, why don't you talk to Lucia and see what you think? And as soon as I got on the phone with her, I knew I had to do it. And that was that. <laughs> Well, well done on that. Uh, she is quite incredible uh, with, with a, a, a fantastic baritone voice. And I can imagine that uh, there would have been uh, obviously some resistance, uh, as, as we see in the uh, documentary, uh, about her performing. And yet, uh, for uh, Don Giovanni, yet she is, uh, you know, quite incredible. Um, I gather you wanted to avoid a lot of that in, t in your documentary. I did, because I felt that the story was really a more personal one. It's about why someone performs, the reason why you are an artist, and what motivates you to become an artist. Uh, one thing that I feel very strongly about in films that are of trans representation, or maybe even the LGBTQ genre in general, is that oftentimes it's about transitions, or it's about coming out, or it's about these things that don't have anything to do ultimately with the people we become. And it was really important to me to really explore how society and performance perceives gender and performance, uh, to think about how we present ourselves to the public after we go through whatever that process may be. Uh, in the case of Lucia, of course, she is trans, but in any scenario, I think the same sort of thing could apply. Uh, absolutely. Hence the title Sound of Identity, which, uh, which is uh, very prescient. Um, Lucia is very open about discussing things uh, uh, and about her anxieties, of course, and, and her abilities um, as you lead up to the performance uh, in uh, the Opera House there in Tulsa. Um, did she provide you with any restrictions in terms of what you wanted to film? No, it's very lucky on that front, actually. Uh, Lucia and Tulsa Opera really did grant us full access to shoot whatever we needed to shoot. And so, of course, my mandate was if they're going to give us that generosity of filming, the first thing I had to do is be equally reciprocal, because clearly uh, I'm not making a film here. There's a real performance that also is happening in the midst of all the international press Lucia is getting from every major publication around the world on top of making a film while we're going through that whole process. And so that to me was essential that with that access also came some responsibility too, to make sure we were not in the way of that performance. Okay, okay, very good. And it, it, the other story, of course, is so interesting about her mentor, Tobias, uh, and his story. Um, and that's so interesting, the, uh, the juxtapositioning of, of the, both of their stories in your documentary. Can you talk about uh, that openness and so on? Yes, I didn't know that Tobias Picker, who is a prolific uh, opera composer, as well as the artistic director of Tulsa Opera, uh, was going to play such a role in the film until we started filming. Uh, it was about a week in, there's a scene that happens in the film where we're in a restaurant and Lucia and Tobias are talking about 
using identity as a currency effectively. Is that a good thing or is it a bad thing to sell tickets to this performance? And I remember calling my producers immediately after we shot that scene and said, I have the film. I know exactly what this film is going to be. Uh, and you're not always that lucky when you're shooting a documentary, right? Where you find out within seven days of filming how you want to structure the rest of it. Uh, but I knew that since Tobias Picker, you know, had recruited Lucia to come play this role uh, for Tulsa Opera to get some publicity, to shake some things up, to make the first trans performer in the country uh, a star in the Tulsa Opera, I thought it was essential to really look at the kind of yin and yang of their relationship. Someone who uh, is kind of seeing the end of their career, even though he's still vibrant and working, he can see, you know, the future in ways that someone that's at the beginning of their career cannot. They're looking back, uh, not just looking forward. And I thought that mentor-mentee relationship and the nature of what that means to any artist uh, was really essential to the film. Uh, look, that works so powerfully and so uh, intriguingly as uh, we learn more about uh, both of them, but in particular about Lucia. Yeah. And we also learn about Lucia's wife, which I found so interesting. Uh, was she happy to be involved, or, although was she a bit she reticent? She was. <laughs> I, I mean, she does, She's there's a bunch of characters that kind of are periphery pieces, right, that kind of add up together, or at least that was my working theory in shooting. And her wife was one of those, because uh, it's not a spoiler to say, I think, that the film is on the backdrop of their 10th wedding anniversary, which is, I I think a really interesting space because when we think about our relationships in life, you know, decades have meaning and uh, in this decade they're across the world because this is what they do for a living right her, her wife is an opera singer she's an opera singer and they don't get to be together for these pivotal moments because these pivotal moments are spent developing our careers and so uh you know her wife i think is an important reminder and she bookends the film uh for the things that artists have to give up to become the people they want to be and that sometimes includes our time with friends and family and loved ones the things that we miss as much as the things Things that we do. It's a choice that you have to make when you're an artist. That's a tough one. And I thought that was really important to explore too. Oh, absolutely. And, and uh, fit so, so well in the, in the documentary. Now, uh, Lucia, uh, uh, I mean, not that I'm that familiar with opera to begin with, but she obviously had, has had a, a really strong international career in Europe, uh, etc. So, uh, I mean, it, it seemed quite natural for her to, uh, to be part of Don Giovanni uh, and and the character of Don Giovanni seemed quite sensible in in that respect too. Um, did you uh, were you inclined to uh, not so much go into her backstory in terms of her um, getting into opera in the first place? I didn't think it was important. And I know that there's some people that have watched the film, I've read a couple of reviews that disagree with uh, that notion. Uh, because I remember one critic wrote something about they had to do some Googling on that. And I, I didn't include it, not because I was trying to hide anything, but because I didn't think it was important. It was about what these 30 days are about to her at this point in her career. Um, I think that when you are an artist on the cusp of something, right? When you realize that you've been working a very long time to get to a certain point, there's going to be a point in your career, I believe, where you either make it or you don't make it. There's got to be a moment where you're divided, you know, the loaves and fishes. It's a moment where you really are separated. And this for Lucia, I felt, was the cusp of that moment where after all of that work, she's either going to make it or she's not. She's getting all of the international press. She's the first trans performer in America to have a leading role. It's a big deal. It means there's a lot of pressure. And so for me, in telling that story, the only thing that mattered was those 30 days. Because in those 30 days, that trajectory of what happened, good or bad, would be set for the rest of her career. Very good point. She has an incredible uh, baritone voice and uh, uh, it comes through so strongly in your documentary. It's uh, uh, amazing the way she keeps that voice so strong during her rehearsals and then her final performance. 
Yes, I mean, that was something obviously uh, I alluded to earlier that I wasn't very familiar with opera, you know, stepping into this film. And it was amazing to hear not just Lucia, but also the rest of the performers, you know, you, you kind of get a master class when you spend a, a month or two with performers there at the height of their skill. Uh, it was very remarkable just to hear Lucia perform to see how that evolved over the course of those 30 days, but also all of the, you know, ensemble cast to really see how they have to work together quickly and concisely to put together a piece of live performance for two days of uh, actual delivery, which is something that boggles my mind as someone in film, you know, we make things and then they're finished and you can watch it over and over again. But in the world of opera, of live theater, you spend all this time rehearsing for two performances and that's it. Uh, and that's something that uh, was really interesting to observe. Absolutely. And of course, the, uh, the other aspect of this is getting the audience. And I love the way that uh, Lucia wanted to walk up to people and hand them a flyer or, or get them <laughs> to uh, come along to her performance. Um, I found all of that process so interesting. <laughs> I did too. Uh, I mean, very much this is a process film as much as it is a personal one. And, and I thought going through that, you know, sales process, again, using this idea of identity as currency, how do we use it? And then actually seeing Lucia use that currency as a vehicle, not just her talent, but also what all of it represented and, and seeing how that interacted with the public. I thought that intertwining that story with the personal journey would be a really interesting way to go. Absolutely. And of course, it culminated with uh, a performance that was pretty much a full house from what I could see. It was pretty much a full house. Yes, it was that they were pleased with the, the final results of the show. It's also something else that one or two people have asked me over the, the past year, you know, how many people actually showed up to the performance. I didn't leave a number, or a, you know, a summation of that, because at the end of the day, uh, you know, it would have been great if there was 5,000 people or 1,000 people, but that really doesn't matter when it comes to performance, right? It matters what it means to you. And that, to me, ultimately was the thing that mattered in this film, what it meant to Lucia. Absolutely. And uh, she uh, comes across so strongly uh, in her performance. You obviously shot uh, a lot of material and uh, uh, making the decisions about what's left on the cutting room floor and what's uh, left in the uh, final 90-minute uh, version of your documentary, that obviously is always a difficult decision, I can imagine. It is. I mean, my first edit, I believe, was around three hours. And so it was really just parsing it down to those most essential elements, because I certainly had enough material to make something much longer. But I really felt that giving it the ticking clock, you know, 30 days timeline and keeping it really tight was going to really enhance the urgency of the story. There were several things that I really enjoyed that I would have loved to leave in there that I thought were funny or interesting or entertaining. But at the end of the day, I thought that ticking clock motif kind of uh, enhanced the urgency of all those elements. Okay, very good. How did Lucia react when she saw the final cut of your documentary? Funny thing, I actually saw it with her this week for the very first time in person. Uh, there was a special screening in Atlanta that was presented by Atlanta Pride, Atlanta Opera, Out on Film, and the Outfront Theatre Company. And uh, because of the pandemic, of course, Lucia living in Germany, me living in Los Angeles, everything we've done over the past year since it came out has been on Star, uh, on, uh, on Zoom. And so this was our first opportunity to sit down in person and watch it together. And it it was really fun just to kind of jab each other throughout the screening and uh, and to see the moments that really moved her emotionally and uh, we had a nice dialogue at the end about it too where she said that she was uh, really grateful for the the type of film I chose to make not the one that uh, she suspected was going to be made about transition about all those other things that we skip right past in the film. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Interesting to hear that Lucia lives in Germany. Is she uh, involved in any productions now? Of course. Well, her, she and her wife both live in Germany, and uh, Lucia actually just had... Uh, 
her world debut at the Metropolitan Opera in New York, which obviously is a big deal. Uh, and she also has some upcoming engagements across the globe. I believe she'll primarily be in Europe this uh, fall. Uh, but, you know, Lucia is one of the preeminent uh, baritone singers in uh, global opera. And so she's quite busy with her schedule, for sure. Oh, that's excellent to hear. Um, so the film is, is screening as part of the Melbourne Documentary Film Festival. And as you've been saying, I think, and alluding to, it's, it's screened uh, elsewhere, a number of different places. Uh, what, what are the reactions that you're getting? I mean, so far I, I've received, I think, fairly good feedback from from audiences and different venues across the world, and it's really been uh, been a phenomenal journey to kind of go on uh, in this film. Because for me, uh, you know, two things: one, I wanted to make a film that was a little bit different within this space because. Uh, opera is in many uh, regards, as it's alluded by Michael Cooper from the New York Times, a dying medium. It's a medium people don't talk about very much in pop culture. So I wanted to make something that would be accessible to people who know absolutely nothing about opera. And then two, uh, you know, I wanted to make something that was just a really strong representation of of the trans community that's, you know, empowering, something that doesn't feel dark and depressing, something that really shows the things that we can do when we choose to become the people that we are destined to be. And I think that no matter where you stand on anything uh, in your life when it comes to identity, I think that's a universal story that um, is uniquely lens through someone that's at the cusp of success. You never really see stories about opera singers until they're dead. And so that makes this one pretty unique. It certainly does that. And, and well done on doing that. James, I had a look at your filmography, your background, and you've made a number of short documentaries. Uh, you've also made a drama uh, called Desires of the Heart. Uh, how interesting. Do you prefer drama or documentary? How do you decide? I like all of the above. Um, I, I've been very fortunate in my career to go between docs and narrative films and advertising, and I enjoy doing all three. Uh, I think for me as a director, the, the thing is not so much what story I want to tell. It's about what is the story that I can tell right now. And so if it's a script that's ready to go and we're packaged and we're funded and it's time to go, let's make it. If it's a doc that's packaged and ready to go, let's make that too. Um, I'm not the kind to sit around and wait for something to happen. You might as well get it done in between. So the film I'm doing next is likely going to be a narrative film. Uh, and so I, I think that I've been very fortunate in my career to be able to to have those choices uh -huh, how interesting and you've won a number of awards i've noticed uh, for your film so you you're certainly achieving uh, a, a great deal of success in your filmmaking style um are there any influences uh, on you in terms of films or filmmakers that uh, uh perhaps talk about the way that you make films I have always considered Sidney Lumet and Joff and Demi because they both in their career really were able to go between dramas and docs like you just kind of described. And I hope that uh, if I'm fortunate enough to keep working that uh, I'll be able to do the same thing. Uh -huh. How interesting. And I read also that you were involved with Hillary Clinton's campaign uh, in 2016 uh, in Virginia uh, as the mm -hmm. film director. Um, uh, that must have been a really interesting process for you in terms of trying to support her campaign. It was. I have joked many times that was great until the last day. Um, and so it was a really good experience for me as a as a director to really, you know, work with a lot of public figures and political figures and private figures to really figure how to package something uh, in politics. Uh, and we, of course, won the state of Virginia. Uh, so I was very proud of that. Uh, but that also led to the film that's coming out next later this year uh, called The American Question, which which is about American polarization, how I get out of it. It's a very light film, as I'm sure you can imagine. We've been shooting it for five years and uh, we just wrapped it up and uh, it will be uh, debuting a little bit later in the year. We're very excited about that. I'm glad you mentioned that because I was going to ask you about that film. It sounds such a, a, a great premise about trying to look at the way 
division is existing in American society and uh, the polarization that's going on and uh, trying to uh, heal the country, so to speak. And I suppose your documentary deals with a lot of that. We do. We deal with a lot of those issues. Uh, we shot in a rural, suburban and urban town in Michigan and Pennsylvania from 2016, right after the election uh, through 2021. And we follow these ordinary Americans across political, ideological, socioeconomic lines and couple them with experts across the political, uh, sociological, historical spectrum to put in context what's going on in America, not just today, but five Five years from now, 20 years from now, uh, way into the past to really explain how polarization happens, how we've gotten here, and how we're going to get out of it. Um, and so I think that process obviously uh, has been fascinating. And it started with me working for Hillary Clinton. Uh, if I had not been for that process, I highly doubt I would have directed this film. So you really never know where things are going to come from, do you? <laughs> <laughs> Very true, especially in the in the world of filmmaking and so on. Yeah. Well, look, James, congratulations on your fine documentary, The Sound of Identity, which is screening as part of the Melbourne Documentary Film Festival. And we've been speaking to the director, James Kicklighter. James, thank you so much for talking with me. Thank you so much for taking time. I appreciate it. All the best. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>